We know what a lectionary is, right? A lectionary is defined as a book of readings for worship services. Their Christian Protestant lectionary has Old Testament and New Testament readings set aside for every Sunday of every year. Even though it is November now, you can, if you would like, look into the lectionary and find out what texts have been set aside for April or May or June of next year, of the year after that, of any and every month and year after that. Although I do not preach all the time from the lectionary, I know that there are good reasons a preacher turns to the lectionary when she is deciding which biblical text to use as the foundation of her Sunday sermon. One reason is that preaching from the lectionary provides connecting points between liturgical themes and the biblical text for a particular Sunday. So every church that uses the lectionary is not only connected by the text that grounds our worship, Every church is also worshiping around a common theme. For example, the Presbyterian Church planning calendar has themes like Christian and Citizen Sunday, World Communion Sunday, Domestic Violence Sunday, Awareness Sunday, Children's Sabbath Sunday. You kind of think the church chose those themes because the lectionary text is in some way applicable to the theme for the Sunday, right? Well, you remember Mark 13, verses 1 to 8. We just read that text. In Mark 13, 1 to 8, Jesus declares that not a single stone of the temple will be left standing on another. <laughs> From that cheery note, he goes on to declare that false prophets will come and lead people astray. Then, now that he has everybody's attention, he announces that there will be wars and rumors of more war. Nations will rise up against nations. Earthquakes will tear apart the earth. And in the wake of it all, there will be great famine. End of text. Well, just imagine my surprise when I learned that the Presbyterian planning calendar thought that the most appropriate theme for this lectionary text is Caregiver Sunday. What could the worship planners have been thinking? The temple utterly destroyed. Caregiver? Wars and rumors of more war. Giving care? Devastating earthquake and crippling famine. Be careful now. How does one go from Jesus promising a tearing down to us preaching a building up? I think somebody in the editing room messed up. How much care can you give a congregation by telling them that God's house is about to be torn apart and that all that destruction is the harbinger of even more disorienting devastation to come? Caregiver Sunday? Caregiver Sunday? Really? How in the world can this text possibly be considered a caring text in any way. When I was taught preaching back in seminary, the professor would put biblical texts in a hat on little slips of paper, and we would take turns pulling a text out that we would then use as the text for our class sermon. I can still remember the flushed, agonized face of a good friend after he had reached into the preaching possibility hat and pulled out a text where Jesus was describing hell as a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. He looked like he was going to start weeping and gnashing his own teeth right there in front of the whole classroom. What do you do with such a text? Study it carefully, preach it honestly, and that is what he did. And then after he had finished preaching his sermon, I remember very vividly one of the professor's critiquing questions because he had apparently in all his hard work and powerful preaching left something crucial out of the sermon. The professor asked, but where is the good news? Surely even in such a hard text, there is good news. After all, we're talking about the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. Even in hard sayings about hell, there must be good news. Your job, preacher, is to help us find it even if, especially if we can't find it for ourselves. Because it's not obvious, is it? Is there any good news in this scripture reading the lectionary has selected for us this morning. Can any care be concocted from Mark 13, 1 to 8 on this caregiver Sunday? This text, at least on the surface, just looks bleak and dark and hopeless. How would we feel if Jesus came in here right this minute and told us that not one stone of this church building would be left standing on another? Would that sound like Jesus cares about your building maintenance plan? 
Not one stone of the way of life we have built for ourselves will be left standing on another. Would that sound like Jesus cares about all your life planning? Not one stone of the kind of social or political or economic society we have constructed for ourselves would be left standing on another. Would that sound like Jesus cares about your social strategic steering? Not one stone of the kind of ethical principles we live by and then force other people to live by would be left standing on another. Would that sound like Jesus cares about you being right because other folks are wrong? Not one stone of the church world we have constructed for ourselves, even as we convinced ourselves that God had constructed it for us, would be left standing on another. Would that sound like Jesus cares about our kind of Christianity? How would we feel if Jesus sat down and looked at our carefully constructed, materially manipulated, socially stratified, politically polarized, economically unequal world and told us that not one stone would be left standing on another, that it would all be utterly thrown down. No doubt we feel just like the people who had constructed the Palestinian world of the first century, the way they felt when Jesus declared such destruction about their world. No doubt we'd be angry, and rightfully so. For this Jesus does not sound anything like good, caring news. I have a good life. Actually, I have a great life, a wonderful family, a job that challenges me, a job to which I feel called, a house that we have worked hard on. Well, my wife has worked hard on, and it is so great. We have built a great home in every respect. We worked hard, very, very hard to make it this good. I make no apologies and neither should I. I have built things. Others have built better things than me, better bank accounts, better houses, better careers, better exposure, better faith even. But I'm feeling hopeful that when I meet God one day that I will be able to say that I did my best with the talents and abilities God gave me and I built things with those talents and I am very proud of what I have built. I feel a pride of accomplishment. I want God to be proud of what I have built too. I don't want to hear God Say God is going to tear it down stone by stone because God is disappointed in all I have developed. So too, Jesus' disciples look at these buildings and they see accomplishment. The faithful following of people who used every bit of their spiritual and social and economic and political resolve to establish a house of prayer that is also the center of all social, economic, and political activity for the people of Palestine. They have adorned it using some of the greatest engineering technique and the grandest of stones. Just look, Lord, at what they have built. This temple, considered to have been one of the architectural wonders of the ancient world, as Alan Culpepper observes, located on the highest point in Jerusalem, it dazzled visitors and pilgrims as they approached the holy city. Of Herod the Great's grand structure, the Jewish historian of the time, Josephus, wrote, now the outward face of the temple in its front lacked nothing that could astound either men's minds or their eyes. For it was covered all over with plates of gold of great weight and at the first rising of the sun reflected back a very fiery splendor and made those who forced themselves to look upon it to turn their eyes away just as they would have done with the sun's own rays. But the temple appeared to strangers when they were at a distance like a mountain covered with snow. Commentator Joel Marcus observes that the stones were especially impressive in size and beauty. He says that some of the surviving stones and the retaining wall, which is part of what is now visible in Israel as the Wailing Wall, weigh 50 tons or more. One is 40 feet long and weighs approximately 300 tons. Think of the engineering it took in the first century to place stones of that magnificence into place for the wall of a building. And then, how magnificent four walls built of such stones would be. Marcus continues to observe that the retaining walls towered more than 80 feet above the roadways that circled the temple structure. And on the south, the highest wall of the temple reached some 175 feet above bedrock. So we're talking about in the first century, stones that weigh 50 to 300 tons making up walls at some point eight stories high 
and on the grandest side, 17 stories high. Yes, yeah, seeing that thing in Palestine in the first century, dazzling is the word that appropriately comes to mind. What a wonderful testimony to the determination of the people to respond to God's presence by building a temple to God's glory. This building is. Why would, the, why would the disciples not be overwhelmed by awe and the pride of accomplishment? Look at what God's people have built to glorify God. As we look back on our own life accomplishments, why would we not be proud of what we have built personally, socially, politically, economically, religiously to glorify God? Like the disciples, I am proud of what I have built, what we have built together. And like the disciples, I want Jesus to be proud of it too. Jesus, though, sees the cracks in the foundations of the great things we humans build. We do well to remember the kind of gospel the gospel of Mark is when we approach it. Mark is an apocalyptic gospel. If you didn't know it before reading this passage, you know it after reading this passage. Well, what is apocalyptic material? Well, apocalyptic material is material that focuses on the end of time and how the truth of God's intention for humankind is revealed in the way the end time unfolds. Now here's an example from the book of Revelation, the ultimate piece of apocalyptic material. In the book of Revelation, John of Patmos looks through a door in heaven and God reveals to him the reality of the end time. John sees the future while standing in the present. And in that future, he sees worship. And what does God reveal about the future of worship? God reveals that every tongue and tribe and nation and people will worship God. In other words, worship in heaven will be, already is, universally inclusive. No person from any tongue, tribe, nation, or people is left out. They are all before God, before the throne. That is what the end time of worship looks like. That is what is revealed to John. John then is called to make the present of worship look like the end time of worship. What he sees in the future, God wants him to establish in the present. So if the future is a worship where all people of every tribe, tongue, nation, and people worship God, then our calling is to make our worship just as universal today. In every church, in every congregation, we are called to make worship a house of prayer for all the nations, for all the peoples, not just people like us. Apocalyptic visions in this way challenge the present reality. Apocalyptic visions in this way often demand changes to the present reality. Apocalyptic visions in this way indicate God's intent to tear down what we have so meticulously thrown up. So in Mark, Jesus establishes this apocalyptic sensibility when he starts his ministry by declaring that the future kingdom of God is at hand. God's end game is slamming up against our present playground. And God's future demands that our human present come crumbling down even as God's future goes towering up. How does Jesus then live out this kingdom reality in the midst of this human present? Well, in a world that says lepers are so defile that they can't be in the regular, regular company of people, Jesus touches a leper and ultimately shares the intimacy of eating in a leper's home. Well, in a world that says that women are second-class citizens to be seen and not heard, certainly not in the company of great teachers like Jesus, Jesus calls women to be disciples and listens and learns from their arguments. Well, in a world that says that we righteous folk only ought to associate with other righteous folks. Jesus goes to parties with reputed tax collectors and known sinners. Well, in a world where no one is above the law, Jesus breaks laws like the Sabbath when those laws have been interpreted so legalistically that they harm rather than heal human brokenness. Well, in a world where the people of Israel, particularly the most zealous, are using the temple as a den of revolt against the Gentiles who have occupied their land, Jesus cleanses and thus condemns the temple because it is not instead a house of prayer that is inviting to Gentiles as it is to Jews. In other words, Jesus, right from the start, because of his belief that God's kingdom is breaking in, starts dismantling the carefully constructed social, political, and religious world of first century Palestine, spiritual stone by spiritual stone. Their world cannot be the same once God's world comes into view. The world they have constructed and the world God has intended cannot coexist. Their world, as magnificent as it is, must therefore come down. But is this not bad news? 
The question reminds me of a Will Willimon quote. Will Willimon, now a retired United Methodist bishop, was the dean of the chapel at Duke University when he preached about an apocalyptic perspective on Christmas. Christmas, we know, is a caregiving season. Christmas is all about good news. And yet, in its apocalyptic sensibility of God's presence breaking into the world, Christmas can also be troubling, even frightening, as frightening as Jesus' promise that not a single stone of what we have built will be left standing on another. Willimon writes, I noted, after my first Advent Christmas at our university chapel, the sermons during this season are among the year's most controversial. Why? After all, we're only getting ready for Christmas. Why should such yuletide preparation provoke resistance in the, ears, in the ears of a university congregation? Is not Christmas among the year's most joyous seasons? Indeed it is, but it does not start with joy. Joy is only the end result. Too often we approach Christmas as if joy is the be-all and the end-all of the season. It's not. Joy is the end result. The first stage of Christmas is the Advent Kingdom breaking in, recognition that most of this world lives in conditions that neither foster nor even allow joy. These are the people for whom the first Christmas was established. Whether the oppression be spiritual, political, social, or economic, Christmas is the light of liberation meant to spark revolutionary change. The kind of change that does not leave one stone standing upon another stone. This is the Christmas God gave us and remains the Christmas we are to emulate. The joy is a byproduct of this. It must not become the thing itself. Hear Willimon again. Our real problem with these Advent Christmas texts is largely political rather than merely intellectual. A great deal will depend on your social location. If you tell me, he says, living in Durham, North Carolina, with two healthy, well-fed, well-futured children, this future is ending, God has little vested interest in the present world order, I shall hear it as bad news. However, for a mother, in a barrio in Mexico City who has lost four of her six children to starvation to hear, this present world is not what God had in mind. God is not finished. Indeed, God is now moving to bring down and to rebuild in Jesus. I presume, he says, this would sound something like gospel. For her, texts you will be asked to deliver this Advent Christmas are not, as has been charged by some liberal critics, an invitation to pie-in-the-sky, by-and-by theology. They are a series of Molotov cocktails meant to ignite a revolutionary conflagration. They begin in the ghettos as whispered expectation among pushy slaves, as the clenched-fisted yearning of displaced Hebrew refugees, as the cry of a baby in a back street born to an occupied people. So when Jesus leaves the temple, the disciples do not pick up on his body language. They enter the temple angry because it refused to be what God wanted it to be, a house of prayer for all the nations. He leaves it angry because of what he sees happen just before he exits. It seems to me, no mistake, that the last scene Jesus has before this chapter 13 apocalyptic warning is the widow's offering. Notice the contrast here. You've got a poor widow and many rich people. She has so very little, they have so very much. She is the one whom Jesus cherishes because she gives all that she has until she has nothing. She has put into the wealthy temple treasury everything she has until she has nothing and the temple is everything. That's how the temple became so grand. Commentator Ched Myers puts it this way, the temple has robbed this woman of her very means of livelihood, like the scribal class that no longer protects widows but exploits them. As if in disgust, Jesus exits the temple for the final time. The temple was supposed to take in gifts from all the people of Israel everywhere in the world and then redistribute those gifts to God's people in need, people like that widow. 
But instead of, instead of taking in and giving out, the temple just took in and kept and used what it kept to build bigger and bigger buildings, magnificent and more magnificent structures. And that is why Jesus is so angry. That is why the temple cannot be left standing. In God's kingdom, there will be no such discrepancy between those who are poor and those who are not poor. There will not be poor and wealthy. There will be only God's people. If that is the revelation of what the future will be, that is also the mandate of what the present must be. But instead of preparing for God's future, the temple perpetuates the people's present. I think this is why an angry Jesus prophesies that the temple will be brought down. Do you know what my biggest fear about this text is? My biggest fear is that Jesus cares as much about people who are not like me as Jesus cares for people who are like me. And that Jesus is willing to tear apart this world that benefits me and people like me and build a world that benefits them too. A world not just for the priests and the temple, but a world for the poor widow who gives all she has so the temple can be the temple. The good news is that the kingdom of God is breaking into human history. The difficult part of that good news is that the future that God intends will confront and tear down whatever magnificent, beautiful, expensive, expansive thing we humans have constructed in the present that resists God's intentions. Where do we see such good news at work? Wherever any Jesus disciple is doing all she can, despite the opposition that comes her way, to make real in the present the invasive, even troubling kingdom vision that God has shown us of the future. We can be a part of this invasion of God's future into the human present. If we do not go running out in panic and desperation, crying out that the sky is falling and the end is coming, if we instead go running out in faith and trust, crying out that God is ending the edifices of brokenness that we have erected, and a new day that has the look and feel of God's last day is opening up right now. A new day where the future that God intends has become the present that we enjoy. Our discipleship task is to see God's future and proclaim and work for that future right here in the midst of our present. Jesus did not see the temple's destruction as the end of all things. Jesus saw the destruction of the temple as the beginning of all things. The beginning of God's future thing in the midst of our present world. I think this text is calling us to see similarly and then to care enough about what God is doing, to care enough about the people that God is doing all this for to find a way to help God do it. And that is why ultimately, amazingly enough, this text about not one stone being left on another and wars and rumors of war is actually a text that fits the theme of caregiving. Apocalyptic caregiving. Apocalyptic good news.